আর আর মেঠো এক্সিলেন্ট ওয়েলকাম uh welcome gabriele thank you for showing yourself and uh, um welcome to everyone who's just joined uh you didn't really miss uh anything we were just giving some broad introduction except that there are some small uh, schedule alterations because unfortunately shaya mukherjee is ill and could not uh come but if you i guess the changes to the schedule are on the website of the school antonio right so check and you'll find out Without further ado, uh, let me introduce Gabriele Schweikart, who is our first lecturer. Uh, she's a, a PI at the University of Dundee in uh, Scotland, uh, United Kingdom, and uh, uh, she runs a computational epigenomics uh, group. Uh, Gabriele did her PhD, has a degree in physics uh, from uh, uh, Munich, and then went on to do her PhD at the Max Planck Institute uh, for, in those days was called Biological Cybernetics. Now it's called Intelligent Systems in Tübingen under the supervision of Gunnar Rich. And after that, she moved to Edinburgh where she worked with some excellent people, uh, including uh, Sir Adrian Bird, the father of epigenomics. And uh, um, since 2018, she is running her own group in Dundee. She was awarded uh, uh, a number of prestigious awards, including a, uh, a research fellowship from the um, um, Medical Research Academy, what it is called, I cannot remember exactly, and also uh, a UK Future Leadership, a Future Leaders Fellowship, uh, which supports her research in Dundee on computational epigenomics. And uh, with that, uh, Gabriele, the floor is yours, and uh, um, I would certainly enjoy and hope everyone else enjoy. If there are questions in the chat, I might just speak up and interrupt you, uh, Gabriele. Is that okay? That's wonderful, of course. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guido, for the very kind um, introduction and indeed for the invitation. Um, I would indeed have loved to come uh, to Italy um, in this December. Um, sadly, it was not possible due to uh, family uh, constraints. Um, so I'm speaking to you from Scotland and it's beautiful here too. Um, so um, I thought for today, I will start giving you an introduction to epigenomics, given that um, we have quite a few um, lessons together. So I think I'm scheduled for today, tomorrow, and then again on Friday. Um, I thought we have quite a lot of time for some in-depth um, motivation and introduction uh, to biology uh, and the biology that I'm interested in, with, which is epigenomics. And I take it that this is a potentially very um, interdisciplinary audience. So I thought it might be um, useful to explain a little bit about that. And usually people know a lot about genomics, but maybe epigenomics is still not quite as, um, as well known. I do hope you can see me well or hear me well as well. Uh, and I would now share the screen with you. Um, here we go. Um, wait a second. I have to say this kind of, this is the first Zoom talk that I'm giving since lockdown, I suppose. We have now moved pretty much back to in-person. Um, so um, I'm sharing my screen, but I think you're probably not seeing it. No, we don't see that yet. Okay, does that work for you? Do you see um, the screen now? You should be seeing the title slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. And um, yeah, I think it would be amazing if you, uh, if this is interactive, so it's it's obviously for you. Um, if I am, um, do interrupt me if you can, um, either in the chat and Guido um, will, um, will, will interrupt me or uh, raise your hand or just unmute yourself to, to ask questions if something is unclear. Okay, um, so I will start with the very basics. Um, this is an interact, in, so I've already been introduced by Guido, but um, from a biological point of view, I suppose 
um, I'm also very much described by um, the genetic context, uh, uh, the genetic material that is uh, stored in my DNA. And as you probably all know, um, this constitutes a two meter long DNA molecule. I have something like two meter string here in front of me. Um, so, and it consists of A, C, G, and T. Um, so it stores quite a lot of information. So if you think about the numbers of letters in that two meter long DNA string, it's roughly 3 billion letters, um, which is the equi equivalence to 4,000 copies of Charles Darwin's original species. So um, that's just a lot, that's quite a lot of um, uh, uh, words um, for, 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 for something um, complex like uh, human individual. Um, so, um, but the, that's not the end of the story, of course. It's not just um, the DNA that makes us um, unique. Um, as you all know as well, we are made up of a lot of, no uh, a very large number of um, cells. Uh, and in fact, um, the precise number of cells varies, of course. Uh, and um, and it's it's also only an estimate, but it's estimated that there's 40 trillion cells in the human body, uh, which is uh, a proper universe, of course. Um, so what is remarkable is that each of these cells, um, as of course, many of these cells can be classified as a certain cell type. Um, so for example, nerve cells or um, uh, skin cells, muscle cells you have there, you have these beautiful hair cells that are in the inner ear that help you hearing. And all of these cells, of course, have exactly the same uh, DNA string um, that encode um, the DNA information. And yet they have a huge variety of different phenotypes and functions, in fact. And again, it is actually still a matter of research how many different cell types there are in the human body. Is it 150? Is it 300? What is the number of precise, the precise number of different cell types? And how is it possible that all these different cells have so different phenotypes, um, but are all uh, containing the same instruction material? And then there's another little bit of a puzzle, of course, which is, um, when we are comparing different organisms, so for example, the mouse and the human, and we are looking again at the same cell type. So for, ex for example, um, Purkinje cells, they have uh, different DNA, um, as we know, um, but the cell types look uh, remarkably similar. And that's probably the, that's the reason why we can use model organisms. So for example, mouse or even fruit flies um, and so on. And we can learn something about humans by studying other organisms, other model organisms. So cell types um, uh, are, um, can be very similar um, across organisms, um, but there's a, di despite uh, not sharing the same DNA. And um, so um, I have to get rid of this. Uh, okay, that's better. Uh, so phenotype and function clearly um, depend on the specific genetic programs, the specific, the specific books that are actually active in any given cell at any moment. So what you read is really um, what matters and what, um, what, what determines who you are. And how is that accomplished in the context and the molecular context of the cell? Um, and that's where epigenetic, um, um, where epigenetic mechanisms come into play. So the cell has a number of tricks in, it po in its pockets um, to really allow cells to um, very specifically access certain genetic programs at a given time point. So on the right here, you see um, an uh, ele electronic, uh, uh, electron tomographic image um, of a cell nucleus. And what you are seeing is in red, um, one chromosome and in green, another chromosome, 
and so on. And clearly um, the DNA is not um, nicely sorted as we saw in this library, that the picture of the library that we have seen before, it, it seems to be quite a mess. So the question is, how can you actually relatively quickly access the right books, the right genes um, when you need it? And so one of the tricks that the DNA, um, the cell uses is DNA methylation. And um, so um, what DNA methylation does is it changes locally um, the physical property of the DNA. So I've now managed to um, click myself away. I'm trying to find myself again. Here I am. Um, so what I'm trying to, to, to show you is, so if you have a long string of DNA and it's all muddled up in your cell nucleus, um, then how do you find very quickly some, some particular um, words or books in that mess? And one thing that you could do is you could use a little bit of sunny tape, and I've done that here. Um, it's a different color, but mainly it changes the property of the DNA. So um, I can find that very easily, even though the string is kind of um, uh, uh, kind of compressed in a in a in a um, in a bowl. And uh, I think uh, this is the way I'm thinking about DNA methylation. So it basically allows you to find certain bits of the DNA very quickly. Uh, so DNA methylation is shown here um, as these little red dots um, on the left corner. Um, so that's just adding a methyl group um, to, the, to the DNA uh, molecule. In reality, it would be the inverse to that. The, the uh, methylation is covering most of your string, but there are little bits which are actually where, where there's no methyl group, there's, there's no CT, uh, CPG methylation. And we'll discuss that in a moment uh, a little bit more. Um, there's a second um, layer of uh, control or, or, yeah, I would say epigenomic control, um, which is these histone proteins, which we are seeing in yellow down here. So the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, um, forming uh, something called a like a beads on a string type of architecture. And again, this is quite controlled. So you have 100 and, uh, 247 base pairs that are wrapped around one um, um, histone protein forming what we call a nucleosome. And um, the spacing or the positioning of these um, nucleosomes is not random, um, at least in, in some important, like at the beginning of genes, it's, it's certainly very organized and, and not random. And you can change the position of these kind of beads um, with chromatin remodelers. Um, and that would allow certain other machinery to actually access the information on the DNA. And then in addition to that, you have his tone modifications. Um, and that's symbolized here with this um, yellow circles and the red triangles, where you actually also change um, bits of these um, nucleus, so this, this histones, and you kind of add like a bookmark, uh, a chemical modification, a very specific chemical modification along, along the genome, um, such that you have a good understanding, um, maybe that some process has ha have already happened along this gene. Maybe the gene has been trans transcribed in the past or that you are marking it for transcription. And there are some other uh, levels on, on, uh, of control, namely um, non-coding RNAs, but I'm not going to go very much into detail about those. So I will first tell you a little bit about histone modifications. And then in the second part, I will tell you more about DNA methylation. And then tomorrow I will discuss more about the machine learning side and how to um, how can we um, make sense of, of quite, quite a lot of data there. Okay. Um, but before I do that, I want to dig deeper again um, into what epigenetics actually means. And um, there has been quite a lot of um, uh, debate about it. It's, it's quite interesting. So when we, um, when we discuss science, we usually just get the facts and things are um, presented as facts. But it turns out that the community is actually not so um, that there's a discussion around facts and that the facts or what we believe in and what, uh, how we understand um, uh, certain words and, and theories and concepts. And sometimes that's actually quite interesting to follow on that. 
Um, so epigenetics, so this was an important paper um, recently um, from um, New York. Uh, Mark Tashnis said there are some core misconcepts. And in that paper, he would write, um, and finally to that dreaded word epigenetics, so he clearly doesn't like that word, Histone modifications are often called epigenetic. One can only wonder why. So here I've introduced you a um, biologic um, mechanism, uh, histone modifications, and we call, I um, majority of people would classify them as epigenetic mechanisms. But he says hist histone modifications should not be considered as epigenetic mechanisms. So let's think about what epigenetics is, how it was defined, and or, or what, what, what the problem there is, because that is really quite important to understand in the sense of what is what, why are they important? Okay, so um, uh, epigenetics, um, the, the word was first coined actually in Scotland in Edinburgh by the Weddingtons, uh, and he defined the epigenetic landscape. And um, really what he had in mind was, so he was thinking about um, how you arrived from a pluripotent cell. Um, so as you know, we all derive from a single cell um, uh, in, in uh, prehistoric times, <laughs> uh, in my case at least. Um, and then these cells um, start uh, to differentiate and to differentiate into, for example, neuron cells or skin, skin cells and so on. And um, Waddington described that um, in analogy to physics, really, um, similar to a ball which is rolling down, a, tra a traveling downhill, uh, a certain landscape. And the landscape in this case would be the epigenetic, um, uh, the, the ep is what he calls epigenetics. Um, so it starts out as a pluripotent cell, um, this, uh, stem, a pluripotent cell, and then um, there come a number of uh, cell fate decisions, um, and eventually you end up with a large number of different cell types. And um, he also. Um, Uh, and, and the remarkable thing is, of course, that these developmental changes, these, these de developmental processes are driven by no changes in the DNA at all. So there must be some other mechanisms that at the time of uh, Vatican weren't known um, that drive these de developmental processes. And while he didn't know what, what kind of processes these were, he called them epigenetic um, changes. So very importantly, some experiments um, came about um, where we um, uh, showed that what he suggested that the differentiation process is unreversible uh, so that the ball can only traverse downhill is actually not true. Um, we can now um, um, actually reverse the process and induce pluripotency. So from our already differentiated cell type, um, there has been experiments um, by uh, Takahashi Yamanaka um, that showed that we can reprogram um, these differentiated cells into a, pl a pluripotent um, uh, st um, state. And this is something that is quite um, routinely done in the lab today. And the amazing thing is that you only need to add um, four transcription factors to achieve this reprogramming. So the forced expression of four specific DNA binding um, regulatory proteins can reprogram, for example, in this case, fibroblasts to stem cells. Um, so the suggestion is that um, now that you, you know that you have transcription factors which, um, bind, which recognize specific motifs on the DNA, which bind to the DNA, and then um, um, uh, control gene expression, um, so if that is the case, what role do you have actually the epigenomic, um, epigenetic mechanisms play that I have been just transcribing, like DNA methylation um, and um, chromatine remodelers and histone modifications? So um, here the question is, is it really the transcription factors that cause this differentiation uh, to happen and are the um, epigenetic mechanisms that I was describing um, not, not causal in that scenario. 
Okay, so this is kind of the um, definition of epigenetics that Vatican gave. Um, so epigenetics is the uh, processes by which the genotype brings the phenotype into being. Uh, and it was similarly formulated as the systems that regulate the expression of the library of specificities, um, that is the genetic material, which is meant to be um, the DNA or RNA sequence. So here clearly what is important about this definition is that it has to do with regulation and control. Um, so, and when we, when we turn that into something um, more machine learning, uh, more related to machine learning, it is really about the, the, the discussion here is really about the direction of this error here in the middle, where you have epigenetic mechanisms that cause the phenotype or expression. Um, and in this case, it's, it's, it's transcription factors are doing the heavy lifting. It seems that transcription factors are the, the, the very important parts here. Um, so in that sense, are epigenetic mechanisms really epigenetic in the Waddington sense? Do they cause gene expression? Um, so, of course, we also know that um, when we have correlation between, histo between X and Y, in this case, histone modification and expression, it doesn't have to be that X causes Y. It could also be that there's a hidden confounder, for example, um, the transcription factor binding sites, which cause both the histone modification and the expression. Um, and um, we can, of course, say that transcription factor, by, so that's um, a paper by Guido, actually, um, where he showed um, that transcription factor binding predicts histone modifications in human cell lines. So it's, it's, uh, this would be a model that would suggest, um, uh, that would uh, confirm this kind of model. And then you have, um, other, um, another, another definition of epigenetics, which um, turns the error around, and it says that epigenetics is important because it really um, provides um, the cell with a memory. And that's quite important because you have to remember, um, you have to maintain your cell state and rem remember it. Um, so in what we'll discuss in a moment as well is that if you're thinking about, for example, uh, tumorigenesis, then um, in this case, the cell will lose some of its acquired um, identities and start doing things that it shouldn't do. For example, it starts dividing again. It might start migrating in the body, uh, all things that it shouldn't do uh, in its fully differentiated state. Um, and therefore, epigenetic um, mechanisms might be a very important way to provide the cell with a memory. So um, here's a uh, definition that says um, epigenetics is the study of mitotically or mitotically heritable changes in gene functions that cannot be explained by changes in DNA sequence. So it's about heritability, um, but mainly for, for, for the most, for the main uh, stream of, of epigenomics and epigenetics, it's inheritance between um, uh, generations of cells rather than individuals. So, um, and another definition, he has properties of a cell mediated by genomic regulators that co um, confer on the cell the ability to remember a past event. And that's really important. Um, so I think for me, the most important, the most uh, plausible way of understanding epigenetics is that it um, provides uh, an, a barrier. Um, and um, so when you're starting from uh, our pluripotent um, cell with our single genome, and you then move into different precursor cells, and down the path of different, uh, towards different um, differentiated cells, you need barriers so that um, that they can't move between different cell states. And in the case of a disease state um, like uh, cancer, these barriers would be removed and the cells uh, would change. And then um, Adrian Bird, he came, he kind of put his, um, uh, he, 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 he said, all of these mechanisms are probably true. Um, so epigenetics is the study of structural adaptations of chromosomal regions so as to register signal or perpetuate altered activity states. 
Um, so in this case, and I think this is the most important thing to understand is um, that it's a very difficult um, um, uh, model of uh, causal uh, relationships. So it is both um, epigenetic mechanisms can cause gene expression. We also have transcription factors, which may cause both the, the modification. I, I apologize. Um, I wrap briefly, just let the dog. <laughs> So <laughs> apologies, that's me back. Um, that was our lockdown. It's it's really uh, bringing me back to lockdown this lecture, I'm sorry. Um, this is our lockdown puppy, um, which is now a little bit of a horse. Um, and um, yeah, he just wanted to say hello. Um, so um, where have I been? Um, okay, so um, why is the study of epigenomic mechanisms so difficult? Um, it is because there's a complex causal structure involved uh, where you have both regulation and control on the one hand, and on the other uh, hand, you have um, a, a, a memory function. And to, um, to disentangle these two is really difficult. So why, do, why are we interested in epigenomics in the first place? So it's of course, because we see that um, a lot of these patterns are changed and go wrong in disease. Uh, both um, for developmental diseases, but also during, for example, tumor tumorigenesis. Um, and then it is not simple, it's not only important to understand correlations, but we want to understand causal um, relationships and mechanisms that, that may cause a certain phenotype. And in this case, it's really hard because we have the we have this kind of very difficult. Um, causal relationships. Um, okay, um, with that, I'm going back to um, the, um, the, the, the kind of the mechanics of epigenetics. So this was kind of the philosophical overview of what is epigenetics. Um, with that, I'm going back to the mechanics and I will start to talk about histone modifications. So Histone modifications are um, shown here as these yellow dots or the uh, red triangles. And I've already said they are really important um, because um, they seem to be changed in a number of different diseases from developmental disorders to cancer. Um, so we want to understand them a little bit better. Um, we already know that there are specific enzymes in our cells. They are, we call them epigenetic writers. Um, so for example, for one of these um, histone modifications, we call it H3K4 tree methylation, for example. Um, there are six different writers. It's a different, it's a family of proteins which establish these marks both in a cell type specific way, but also in a temporarily changing way. And then we also have erasers. We have um, proteins that can remove these marks. And we have also proteins that can specifically um, recognize these marks and then either recruit other transcription factors or um, expression machinery and so on. So what is emerging here or what is, has been emerging here for a long time is that there's actually an additional code there. So you have writers and readers, you have erasers. So it's possible that there's an epi uh, histone modification code on top of the DNA, mo um, DNA molecule. And that's, I think, quite um, exciting um, to think that potentially we could decipher this, this additional code, but we are not there yet, I would say. So what is also very important is that some of these marks are highly correlated with gene expression. So with, with the reading of a given book or the um, reading of a given gene. So for example, H3K4 tree methylation is found. Um, so I have to explain this, this, this slice a little bit. This is very important because this is what we are going to work on. Um, so what you're seeing here is a bit of the genome in this case of yeast. Um, so on the um, x-axis in that case, that shows you a little bit of the genome um, on the DNA string. And the green boxes here are genes. 
They are very dense in this case. And the arrow tells you in which direction they are being transcribed. Um, so these are transcribed in this direction. And this one is, this is the only one transcribed in the forward direction. And what you can also see is that this gene um, is um, the, marked in green here, um, it, it's, we can measure that it's highly expressed, so it's being read, um, while this gene is not expressed um, and it's, uh, it's not expressed, it's repressed, it's silenced. So, and when we look at different histone modifications, so for example, H3K, H3K4 trimethylation, we find that it's highly correlated with the activation of genes. Um, like this one, and in particular, usually we find it the at the um, so I think it's actually this 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 mark is HVK4 trimethylation. We find it at the beginning of the gene um, at the promoters. Hi, so um, we can measure um, we can measure um, the enrichment of this mark along the genome. That's what this symbolizes, and we are doing that across our an ensemble of cells. And then, um, and I'll discuss the, um, the the experimental measurement tomorrow, I think. So, but this just means that there's a high likelihood at this location on the genome for H3K4 trimethylation. And here, for example, there's no H3K4 trimethylation, and here is also not H3K4 trimethylation. So what you can see is that where the gene is expressed, there's a high amount of H3K4 trimethylation, and where it's silenced, there's none. And then on the other hand, you have marks, for example, H3K27 um, trimethylation, uh, which require a different reader, different writers, and so on. And they are more correlated with silencing. Again, um, so this suggests that they have a functional role um, in controlling um, gene expression. So, and both of this, um, so the fact that you have writers and readers and that there is a correlation with active gene transcription suggests that there's an histone code and instruction for gene expression. Um, however, you could also think about um, a code um, when you go again to the library, um, you will also um, remember who has um, actually read the book in the past. So it's a, a system of symbols that re represents a message and that can record information. And so it could be that um, when the gene is uh, transcribed, um, you are actually setting a mark, uh, and uh, uh, a, you are setting a mark, an epigenetic mark, to remember that this gene has been transcribed in the past and that it should be remaining transcribed, for example. So again, you have the instruction for gene expression and a record of previous um, transcription. And now if you are seeing changes, uh, for example, in a disease state, you would want to know, is that actually a causal uh, change in the epigenome that causes changes in gene expression, or is that rather a byproduct, a, a consequence of a ch uh, altered um, expression change? What we do know is that, during, um, that, they are, that these epigenomic patterns change dynamically, so both during development and, uh, de development and differentiation. And we have also increasing, um, um, uh, so with single cell data, for example, we have an increasing understanding that there's also at least some causal uh, relationship between these histone modifications and the phenotype. Um, so what you are seeing here is that you have genes when you look at um, single cell data uh, and you order the cells according to their differentiation states, according to similarity, you find um, uh, genes that are um, uh, repressed, where you have the H3K27 methylation mark, um, and then they go through a poised state where you have both of these marks. And then in the last state, in the active state, um, the H3K27 methylation has been um, removed. Uh, you have the transcription factor binding site and the gene is transcribed. Um, okay, um, so very important is also um, that um, these, uh, in this case, when we are looking at um, the epigenetic writers, so so the, here's so we can look at uh, at these mechanisms in a number of different ways. We can one one of the ways we can look at it is we can um, record the 
um, marks themselves across different conditions or across different time points and cell lines, um, like here. So these would be the actual marks. But we could also look at these enzymes. So for example, the readers and the writers. And when we are looking at um, H3K3 methylation again, um, I already mentioned that there are six proteins in, in this family that um, establish these marks. And all of these um, uh, family members have been identified um, as um, uh, in, in uh, genome-wide association studies, for example, um, to carry mutations in, um, neuro, in very severe neurodevelopmental syndromes. So that shows you that this, these, these, these writers are really important. Um, and it's not just the mark that has changed um, as a consequence um, of um, as a consequence of, of, of a disease. Um, also, when we are looking at um, tumorigenesis, um, so we also observe that there's abnormal changes in the epigenomic patterns again. So we can compare um, these epigenomic histone modifications in tumor samples versus normal cells, and we see differences. But also, uh, again, we see um, that the readers and writers are very much implicated uh, in a number of very, very different cancer types. Um, so this was a very comprehensive study um, um, that was trying to identify um, cancer, driver mutation, uh, cancer driver genes and mutations uh, across a large number of um, different diseases, cancer diseases. And um, so it was pan cancer data, 299 um, cancer driver genes in this case were identified. And a lot of these driver genes and mutations were shared across anatomical um, origins and cell types. Uh, and quite a lot of those harbor um, actionable on on oncogenic events. <clears throat> so if we are looking at the types of genes that are um, identified here, um, that's Gabriele, yes. There is a question in the chat. It's uh, yes. what does poised and repressed mean in this case? I think the concept of poised is particularly non-trivial. Yes, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so I that was uh, in this uh, case. Um, yeah. So the 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 gene is ready to be transcribed, but it's not yet transcribed. Um, so it's 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 it has the capacity of being transcribed. It's not fully silenced. Um, I'm I'm not sure there's a precise definition of poised um, there. Um, yeah, but it's it's a it's a state where the gene is not yet transcribed, but it has acquired quite a lot of um, properties such that it, it can be transcribed in the future. Um, okay. Thank you. Other questions? All clear so far. All clear so far. Okay, so here I wanted to show what I find quite fascinating is that um, these processes are both important during development, so early in our life, uh, and this is um, demonstrated here with all these different um, uh, early um, problems, but they are also really important later in life during tumorigenesis and aging. So they are kind of the same, tumorigenesis and um, uh, so in terms of the epigenomics, there's a lot of things going um, in one direction or another in these two processes. Um, so the sec second part here, I'm talking about more like cancer. And what is really interesting, if you are looking at these different cancer types, so you have them um, in uh, on the bottom, these are all different sorts of cancer. Uh, and then you have genes which are identified to be um, uh, in these genome-wide association studies to be important uh, for these um, for the onset of these cancers. And you find that quite a lot of them, like uh, epigenetics DNA modifiers, are implicated in quite a few. Chromatin, um, the uh, three SNF complex is very important in a, a large number of um, cancer types. The histone modifications, readers and writers, 
um, are, are important and, and other chrom chromatin histone modifiers, chrom chromatin others. So the, chrom the context, so the way um, which books are read in the library is really important for cells to function. And the important thing to remember is also um, that epigenomic patterns are uh, to some extent reversible because we have these readers and writers um, and so they offer potential uh, really interesting um, drug targets. So again, this is the same family of teens, and you can see um, that um, they are not redundant because they all um, have uh, they have they are they are impl implied in different. Well, there's some overlap there, um, but they are also implied in a number of different um, cancer types. So it's the same family of genes that I've shown you before for the neurodevelopmental um, diseases, um, also important for cancer development. So what is the what are the challenges here? Why do we talk about epigenomics in um, something that's more to do with machine learning and, and, and data analysis, maybe? Well, what you can see here is that the data is high dimensional uh, and it's also quite tricky. It's not um, independent. So you can see. Um, so this is a larger bit of what I've shown you before. Um, again, you have the genes on the top, you have the different histone mo uh, modifications on the y-axis, and you can see that there's quite complex dependency structures between these marks. So for example, here, it's pretty clear that these guys are not written independently. They show very similar patterns. Um, and that is because a lot of the complexes um, actually have domains which 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 are readers and writers. So it's possible that you have a, a domain that in your protein that um, recognizes um, a certain histone modification and then writes another one. Um, so they are not independent, but also these dependency structure varies over time. So um, this group, for example, um, I am not sure if I'm finding a good example, um, but, but you can believe me that um, the histone modifications which are similar uh, in one area of the genome uh, may not be may, may look quite different in another area of the genome. Uh, so there's uh, a, a non-trivial uh, independence uh, dependency structure. Um, the data is we have large amounts of data now, but the data is actually quite sparse. Um, because um, you can imagine that we don't have, we have not only the individual um, component, we have the different cell types, and we also have potential, potentially a temporal component. So, for example, during um, during uh, cell division, um, these patterns change. Um, or during development. So it's the age is important and so on. So the data that we are actually having is quite sparse. And again, it's very difficult to say if we see changes in one part, do they actually cause a change um, in, in the expression of the genes and ultimately in the phenotype of that given cell? Gabriele, we have another question uh, in the chat from Tasmin. Uh, can the epigenetic writers act as erasers and vice versa, or is the function exclusively associated? Um, I, um, that's a good question. I, so these, um, the, the readers and writers, usually they are bigger complexes, so they are made up and they're racist too. They are made up of a number of different proteins. So I do think that um, the erasers also have, uh, so they need to be, in the first place, they need to be recruited to the histone modification pattern at a given time, right? Uh, so they need to uh, recognize this pattern at a given time. So they, they contain readers as well. So basically there are shared elements between the complexes, but they're distinct. Yes, so they have, so some of the complexes have something like um, six, to eight different proteins and the proteins have different um, domains and the domains can have reader and writer domains and they can record some of them can also um, interact with the transcription uh, machinery and so on so it's really complex and i think um yeah this com combinatorial patterns um combinatorial um, action um, is what makes the data analysis so tricky i think thank you
Okay, so um, this is, um, I guess, where machine le learning can um, uh, come into play. Um, so I was told I should start with the very, very basics. So I'm having a couple of slides on machine learning. Um, so just to give you an idea um, how this could help, help. It's sometimes I'm showing these slides also to biologists. So I'm, uh, I hope this is this is okay. Um, so um, so when when is machine learning useful? Well, I think it's useful um, when you have a lot of data available. Uh, I said data is sparse, that's true. Um, but at the same time, we do have quite a lot of data, uh, at least more data than can be analyzed via visual inspection usually. Um, and there's also the assumption that there's a relationship um, between um, your different data sets. So epigenetic mark and genome expression, for example. So in a sense, the idea is that the data is predictable. Um, and the problem is, however, that we do not really know how, um, what the laws that govern the relationship um, between X and Y. So uh, we know that there is a relationship. Otherwise, I think um, it, it doesn't make too much sense, but we don't understand the laws that govern this relationship. And then um, you start with our, so most of machine learning in general, and that, or what you call probably even AI, is, is has to do with um, supervised learning. So you start with a training set where you have, for example, X and Y measured for the same instances, for n genes, say. And then you try to find a function f such that f of x is, is, um, is, is y. And once you have this function, then um, you can, um, uh, you can, you might get new data for x and you can apply the function f of x and get new predictions y. And of course, there's a lot of different things in the middle here. This is in this case, I, I um, put a simple perceptron model, but it could also be a much more complex um, deep learning model, or it could be a support vector machine, or it could be something completely different. Um, so, but in many cases, this is to some extent a, a, um, a, a bit of a black uh, box. So in most standard scenarios, um, this is based on correlation, not causation. And I think we have to, um, it's, if you find the correlation, it is very, very easy to, to think about causation. But as I was trying to, to make clear throughout this whole talk, it's, it, this is much more difficult. Um, so, and that's, um, that's where I want to stop here, um, with the histone modification in the machine learning. So I think we'll go into more detail. Um, uh, one, one example that I want to show is um, where we have um, used a transformer model in this case to make predict prediction uh, of histone modifications themselves. So as I said, it's a sparse data set. We can't measure all these different histone modifications across a large number of cell types. Um, so we have then developed a um, model to make predictions, given that we have seen some of the histone modifications, can we make a prediction on others? And we'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow. Um, so here I'm going to continue with the biological um, motivations, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, DNA methylation. How much time do I have uh, left? I think 20 minutes or something like that. Oh no, you got much more. You have 45 minutes, but there is a, a, a question in the chat uh, and okay. I'll read it to you. It says, uh, uh, I know ML is a suitable method for your problem, but I want to know about any modeling, the mechanism for epigenetics. Is there um, any model for that? So are there also <laughs> mechanistic models uh, that... Uh, that address epigenetic, I imagine, you know, you could decide whether globally or locally uh, to some extent. Yes, I think that's really important. I think it has, it's going back and forth. I think, um, um, I, I don't think there's one model that answers that question. I think we are not, we haven't properly understood um, epigenomic mechanisms and how they contribute to, um, to, to the transitions, for example. Um, so, but there are, um, 
there are efforts to make these models more explainable. And also, I think it has always to come. Um, so, so I guess that the problem is that it's also, we, we are lacking a lot of, we are lacking the goal, a gold standard to some extent. Um, so I think it's, it's always a cycle between making predictions and then going back to the lab, validating, making experiments and so on. And that in many cases, um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, my, my sense is that if we are trying to, um, to make global assumptions, so for example, um, and that, that, that has been made for a long time, like H3K4 tree methylation is associated with um, active promoters. Um, so it might be related to switching on genes. Um, I think um, that is too simplistic. I think we have to understand more different types of promoters in different um, contexts of these uh, marks. Um, so because we have seen experiments, for example, where, where um, some of the marks are almost completely removed uh, because we have knocked out some of the writers, uh, but the transcription readout remained almost the same or the same for most genes except for a few. Um, but this is also depending on the cell type. Uh, so a lot of these experiments have been done in ES cells. So is that the same in fully differentiated cells? Um, how about if we want to um, use, or how, how about if we want to use these, um, these knockout models in ES cells and then try to differentiate these um, pluripotent cells? Are they still able to go through the same differentiation pathways? So I think in a lot of cases, there are so many different combinations that need to be tested. And it seems like there's no global answer to that question. So I think we have to go back to some extent to more specific um, uh, cases. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't think there are models out there that are um, satisfactory um, explaining the epigenomic code and what it does to transcription. If that's, but but there there are some efforts, and we can discuss some of that tomorrow. I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the other thing is DNA methylation. So um, that's a second part of the epigenomic um, um, uh, mechanisms that I want to discuss briefly. Um, so, so DNA methylation usually happens in the context of a, so it means that um, there's a, a methyl group added to the cis, uh, cytosine. So this one letter C in your um, DNA, and it usually happens in the context of CGs. So these are um, just, you know, letter, um, like two words, two, two, two letter words, CGs. And um, in the context of these um, CGs, the C um, can get um, a, a methyl group added to it. Um, and um, that is actually quite interesting. Um, so what is quite interesting actually is that um, MCPG is very wi widespread in the mammalian genome. So about 80% of CPGs are methylated. So I've um, shown you before this, this long string and I've said there's so you can add a little bit of a um, uh, tape to it. Um, but in reality, it's the inverse. The majority of the string would be kind of taped and then there's little bits um, that are free from methylation. Um, right. And um, I mean, you have to, I guess, if you you don't know too much about genomics, you might also be interested to know that um, we have about 20,000 genes on our DNA, and they make up only something like, I think, 3% of these um, large, um, this, this, this very long uh, DNA molecule. So there's a long, there are long stretches of intergenetic material and some of that is coding and some of that is actually not coding but the majority uh, so it's not coding but there could be um, other elements which are important functional elements but but for some of them we, we still don't know what it what, what it um, encodes and there's lots of repetitive elements and um, retroviruses which are entered in the into the genome and so on which is mainly silenced um, in the genome and um, so the majority as well is covered with 
um, so has uh, contains methylated CPGs. And interestingly, uh, that creates um, a, a certain structure, a certain landscape on, on the DNA. Um, so um, you have, again, here, the x-axis would be your, um, your DNA. And what, the way we are symbolizing CPGs and methylated CPGs is by these kind of little balloons. Um, so if it's black, it means that it's methylated. And if it's um, an open circle, a white circle, it means that it's unmethylated. And it turns out that in the bulk genome, in the majority of the genome, um, you find less CPGs than you would expect by chance. Um, and also um, that these CPGs are um, predominantly um, methylated. And uh, then you have, on the other hand, CP, so-called CPG islands, and they have a high density of CPGs. These CPGs tend to be unmethylated, and they also tend to overlap with promoters and sometimes with enhancers and other functional elements. Um, so uh, you could very well imagine that they are that this is a mechanism of really finding these important bits of the start of the genes very easily uh, without having to read the whole DNA just by changing the property of the DNA. Okay. Um, what is also interesting is that um, when you look at these um, DNA methylation patterns, um, they are highly conserved, um, but they are very cell type specific. Um, so in this case, this is human. Um, it's part of a genome browser, so it's a bit difficult to to um, to read if you don't uh, if you haven't seen if you're not used to that very much. So what you're seeing at the bottom is a number of genes. Um, these kind of blue ones here. You can see that as opposed to the data that I showed you before, which was taken from yeast, this is human data, and the genes are much more spaced out. Uh, so there's a huge area here where there are no genes. This is actually a dense, it's, it's still a dense area of genes, but you have an area here without many genes. And um, then the yellow lines here um, are uh, DNA methylation. And DNA methylation in this case can vary between zero and one. Um, basically, it means that all the samples that you are getting from a, you know, um, a sample of, of lots of cells are either fully methylated. So all of them have a methyl, methyl group at a given C, that would be um, a value of one, or they are completely unmethylated. That's a value of zero. Um, so you have little um, CPG islands, for example, here. There's, there's something. Do you see my, my, my mouse, my cursor? Yes, yes, we see it. Yes. OK, so here's a CPG island, for example, um, the, the blue one here. And then you have a structure here. And that's very well um, conserved across all these different samples. It's a fine structure as well. Um, uh, but you have samples here from the brain, and it has a very different patterns. And then you have blood up here, and it's, again, very different. So these, these methylation patterns, the, the yellow bits are the measured ones, and then the um, blue and green ones are actually inferred areas of um, hypermethylation are strongly cell type specific, um, but they are also conserved across uh, different samples of the same tissue, for example. So, uh, and, and that's where we think that they might be highly functionally important. And we do know again with DNA methylation, we have a better understanding how important DNA methylation really is. Um, so what is also so um, what is also really important about these epigenetic um, mechanisms is that you can actually um, inherit them from one cell um, generation to the next. Uh, and this DNA methylation, we actually know and understand quite well how that happens. Because um, you probably know that we have the double-stranded DNA sequence, and so we have a forward strand and we have a reverse strand. And um, wherever you have a G on the forward strand, you would have to have a C on the reverse strand. And where you have a C on the forward strand, you have a G on the reverse strand. And then you read in this direction on the forward strand and in the opposite from right to left on the reverse strand. And that means if you have a CG on the forward strand, you also have a you also have a CG on the reverse strand. 
And then if you have fully methylated CPGs, they would carry the, the methyl group on both of their strands. Um, and you could also have hemimethylated CPGs that also only carry the methyl um, group on one strand or uh, unmethylated CPGs. And this provides some mechanisms for, for heritability. Um, so, and there are, no, I'll start with that. So there are enzymes that specifically um, recognize um, these hemimethylated CPGs that, are, um, that have only one uh, methyl group, it's called a DNMT1. Uh, and they are um, creating these uh, fully methylated CPGs. Uh, and then there are enzymes again, which are erasers, and they are called um, TET proteins, uh, which remove the methyl group. And you have also de novo methyl, um, uh, methyl transferases, the DNMT3A and B. So you, at the same time, so when you go through differentiation, you want to have the possibility to add new um, patterns. Um, therefore, you need the, the de novo material um, transferases, but you will also want to go to remember that you are, for example, a progenitor cell on the pathway to a fully differentiated neuron cell. And then you, in the next, um, while the cells are still proliferating, you have to bring that pattern over to the next generation. And that's done with the DNMT1. And um, how does that happen? So when you have the replication fork, um, so when the cell divides, your double strand um, DNA is going into, you know, you have to, it's, it's going to, um, to be copied. You have the replication fork here, and this part is going to go into one daughter cell, and this one is going to go in the other to the other daughter cell. And um, when you newly synthesize your DNA, um, there won't be a methyl group. Um, so you have DNMT1 to recognize that there's a hemimethylated CPG, and then it's copying basically the pattern uh, from, the, from, the, from the maternal cell uh, to the newly synthesized strand. And that means that the cell, the, the, the methylation um, can really be stably inherited across a number of different generations of cell divisions and cell cycles. And therefore you have kind of, so the most stable way of, 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 um, of saving information is of course the DNA. It's, it's um, stored, the information they are stored across generations of individuals. Um, but then uh, DNA methylation provides a mechanism that can store information over almost a lifetime. Um, so that's why we also believe that, for example, events that happen early in your childhood uh, might, might be stored um, into adulthood um, uh, with these kind of mechanisms. And they are also very important, for example, for things like learning and memory generations and so on. Um, also very interesting, but well, that's a completely different story. Um, so the DNA methylation um, is completely erased um, basically at the beginning of life when you have a um, when, when you start over with a new individual in, in, in the gametes. Okay. Um, that's a much more complex version of the same oh, thing. We, we, we got uh, more questions on the chat. We have a very active chat compared okay. to the actual room. So guys, I'm expecting lots of questions from you okay. at the end. Okay. Um, so uh, Tasneem again, how can you say the different pattern is for hypermethylation based on what criteria? So I guess the question is, how do you say it's hypermethylated in a particular tissue? What do you compare to? Ah, okay. Um, I think, yeah, that's, I mean, it's always a relative question, I suppose. Um, so I think um, hyper or hypermethylation. So I guess um, the, um, in, a, in a sense, you could say um, um, that the bulk of the genome is assumed to be fully methylated. So if you don't have any genes there, um, so for example here, you would expect that the majority of the genome is fully methylated, and you can see that with the you know solid yellow um, yellow colors here. So so the the yellow is here is actually individual bars at every single CPG, but it's so dense um, that it's a, it's almost like a solid yellow bar. So it's fully um, hypermethylated. Uh, and then you have areas where you have um, predominantly at the starts of genes, but, but you have these CPG islands where you have a high density of CPGs. Um, 
um, and where you expect uh, hypomethylation, in this case, hypo relative to the bulk of the genome. Um, so this means that they are, so um, for example, the blue regions here are called hypomethylated regions. So they mean that they are unmethylated basically as compared to the rest of the genome. But you could of course also um, think about looking over it um, across cell types. And then if you, um, this, this bit in this case would be um, in these cells hypermethylated as compared to the, the brain data, um, or you could say the brain data is um, hypermethylated as compared, compared to this data. Mm. Okay, so it, it, it is a, so what is also, if you're talking about cancer, for example, um, what is very interesting is that you can't, cons the, these, these separation of um, CPG islands and the bulk genome is to some extent lost. So you gain methylation in the CPG islands and you lose methylation in the bulk genome. And therefore this, this very strong contrast um, is kind of lost. And I think that's one of the problems why, um, why um, uh, that, that cause quite significant problems. Excellent, yes. And uh, there is another question still in the chat. Are there any non-genetic factors that could control or regulate DNA methylation? So non-genetic, I imagine we're thinking about uh, environmental factors. Yes, I, I think that's that's really important. I think that the epigenome is really able to integrate um, uh, a stimuli from the external stimuli um, and um, and the and the DNA, the genetic basis, um, and that's I think really important to. But how this happens is in most cases I think there are some some events, for example, with pain. Um, so we have we know that um, if you have, um, for example, in early childhood you are exposed um, to um, to severe pain um, repeatedly, then you observe at a number of different genes you observe um, methylation changes, uh, which are linked. But this is a lot of this is still kind of hypothetically. Um, so these methylation changes are. Um, are a response to a systemic um, uh, experience of pain, and they are um, they can be remembered by these cells, and then cause um, and then lead to a different way of chromatic uh, of of chronic pain in later in later life. Yeah. So one interesting example: uh, people that go on uh, uh, polar exploration vessels, ships, they have to train to. Uh, dive into cold water, uh, progressively colder, because if a person that is not used falls into the, the Arctic waters will die instantly. Uh, while if you train, you can actually train your body to uh, uh, not respond so severely to the cold shock. And it's presumably an epigenetic mechanism. Uh, although I don't think anyone has, you know, sacrificed one of these humans to see exactly which uh, patterns of DNA methylation were changed. But certainly also in sports, uh, via blood, sam blood samples, people detect changes in DNA methylation after training. So people, if you start running, you do a blood epigenetic test now, in a month's time, if you run every day, you will see some changes. But how these then link to uh, actual gene expression, I guess nobody knows, but we have a question in the room. Aha. Uh, so did you hear the question, Gabriele? No, so the not... question is whether hemimethylation is inherited. So when, when there is fully methylation, you know, we you've explained that, you know, hemimethylation then becomes fixed to full methylation by the NMT1 or three. Um, but what about hemimethylation? Does it, um, is it inherit inheritable or, or it just doesn't it, exist? Uh, inheritable, that's a good question. And I should know the answer to that. Um, so, I mean, we, we observe, so the data that I'm looking, that I've been um, looking at, um, 
So I think that it's mainly an, a transient state. Um, I think it's difficult to under to uh, um, to ex, uh, to. Uh, there are experiments, and I know that there are experiments and, and papers out there that have studied that. Um, I, I I can give you the answer tomorrow to that one. Um, so I think what is difficult is that most of the DNA methylation uh, data is still, I would say, not single cell data. So we are using instead averages across a large number of cells. Um, so you would have to look um, in the same cell um, whether... Um, uh, so if it's if it's if it, the forward and the reverse strand is methylated in the same cell and in the same way, or if it's just an average across an effect across average of um, of many cells. Um, so, so I know you, Jörn Walter was doing these uh, hairpin uh, experiments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. So I don't know what they came up with with that experiment. I'm, I would have to read um, up on these these papers. Um, yeah. But it's it's without uh, single cell um, data and single cell data is still um, it's it's even more sparse. I would say, and it's, it has its own challenges in the analysis. Um, it's rather difficult um, to say. So what I can say is so. Um, when we are looking at, um, so we have done, for example, an experiment in uh, looking at mouse brains. And um, so that is a mixture of a large number of different cell types, in, in fact. And we looked at the methylation patterns, and they are highly, con so not just the, the zero, the unmethylated ones and the fully methylated ones, but the intermediate levels of methylations are also very, very well conserved. Um, so the, the intermediate levels of methylation um, is, um, I mean, it's getting really complex here, because if you have cells which are proliferating, which are dividing, so there will always, so with every cell division, you're losing half of your methylation that needs to be um, reestablished. And um, they are different. So replication doesn't happen instantaneous. Instead, you have um, replication uh, foci across the genome um, where, um, where their replication starts at different, slightly different time points. And some of these um, happen earlier in the cell cycles and uh, cell cycle and other happen later in the cell cycle. So if you don't have synchronized cells, um, it's, so you would not only have an average of a, over a large number of cells, but you would also have kind of a time average. Um, and the time average means that if if the replication, uh, so how quickly is it reestablished after after replication, and that varies over different uh, loci. Um, so. Um, it's a difficult question, to be honest, uh, uh, to, and I can't give you the answer uh, straight away. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, by and large, it's believed to be a fairly transient state, so it doesn't really happen very often to have any methylation. I, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's a stable state. I think that's the, the um, but you never know. Yeah. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, Okay, we've been there. Um, so I just wanted to give you again a little bit of an idea of this methylation cycle. So, and to some extent that 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 might also shed some more light on. So you have an unmethylated CPG. Um, you have then the de novo methyl transferases, which are called DNMT3A and 3B. Um, they mainly create uh, hemimethylated CPGs, but potentially also fully methylated CPGs. Then you have DNMT1s, um, which are copying the methylation pattern from one strand to the other. And um, you have this passive demethylation, which happens during a replication. So if you are going through replicate, if you replicate, you, if your cell replicates, um, the CPG, um, the unmethylated CPG will of course stay an unmethylated CPG. It will produce two unmethylated CPGs. The hemimethylated CPG will produce one in the daughter cells will produce uh, unmethylated CPG and another um, hemimethylated CPG. 
and your fully methylated CPG will go into a hemimethylated state. So here you can already see that after the first progression of a cell cycle, you have only half of the number of um, hemimethylated CPGs. So suggesting also that it's not a stable state. Then you have also active demethylation, uh, which happens through these different TET enzymes. And um, again, um, this active demethylation can also uh, happen to the uh, hemimethylated state. Um, uh, yes, so as you see, and these are kind of transient states as well. So um, to some extent, also the hydroxy uh, methyl CPG uh, might be functional in particular in brain. It, it does seem to be quite functional. Um, so, but with that, you are creating something that is quite remarkable. So you are, on the one hand, you are allowing these dynamic changes um, during differentiation. So you can introduce um, de novo methyl transferases, but you also create an epigenomic memory, which preserves, uh, helps to preserve cell identity. So it's a very intricate um, system of information um, passage, which I find quite um, um, fascinating. And um, so this is, um, I just wanted to also include some of the work that I did um, in Edinburgh. Um, so in this case with Adrian Bird um, and uh, Guido said he's the father of, of epigenomics. I think there, um, as, it, as it is um, always many fathers and potentially one or two mothers as well um, in any bigger scientific um, uh, development, um, but he was one of the first, uh, he was the first one who identified a um, epigenetic reader, um, namely MECP2, methyl CPG binding protein 2, uh, which specifically binds to um, CPGs and it binds to methylated CPGs in, um, in particular. And um, then uh, a little bit later, um, it was um, uh, linked, this protein was then linked to a disease which is called Red syndrome. Uh, and it's a very, very uh, severe disease. And we have been studying it. Uh, it was a bit of a painful experience, I think, which I shared in that case also with Guido. Um, so um, this, this, in terms of, it's just a scientific, um, uh, scientifically, it was a difficult problem at the time and still is to some extent. So this protein is the si single cause to a very um, severe um, neurodevelopmental disease called Red syndrome, um, which affects uh, little girls. Um, so it's X-linked, it's on the X chromosome. And, um, so these girls are born without um, many um, symptoms, but after maybe nine months, 12 months, they start um, uh, losing some of the abilities that they might have already acquired, for example, speech and um, purposeful hand movement and so on. Um, so, and it can develop quite severe um, symptoms. So uh, someone said, imagine the symptoms of autism, cerebral palsy, Parkinson, epilepsy, and anxiety disorders all in one little girl. So it's a very, very complex disorder. But it's one of these um, disorders which has indeed a very si um, simple root, um, namely um, mutations in this one protein. So in a number of other diseases, like in fact Parkinson's disease, aut uh, autism, and so on, um, you have they, they have you you have multiple. They are complex diseases um, with many multiple um, loci be being involved all having a small effect, but together having a, a bigger effect, which are difficult to study. But in this case, we really know that this protein, which has the main purpose of recognizing met or which has a functional domain to recognize methylated CPG is responsible uh, for this very um, complex disorder. And it's, so it seems central really for how our um, cells work and neurons work in particular. So, um, as I said, it's X-linked, um, it's a methylation-dependent DNA binding, and it's specifically highly, highly expressed in neurons. Um, and um, so- You have a question in the room, yes. Gabriele. Can we use uh, TEDs to solve this problem? Can we use what? TED, uh, eraser. Ah, can we use erasers to solve Red syndrome? 
Uh, well, not yet. I think we haven't <laughs> solved the uh, uh, red syndrome yet, but I think Gabriele is going to tell us a little bit more about so, uh, it now. So so I mean that's a, a good point, but um, I think you 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 got it the wrong way. What I'm trying to tell you here is how important DNA methylation is, and if you can't, so in this case it's the reader who can't recognize it proper, properly. So um, it's the problem is not with the DNA methylation; it's the the, the itself. Um, so in fact, we have what we have started to do in a different experiment. We have. Um, disturbed the DNA methylation patterns and uh, knocked out um, DNMT1, so the maintenance uh, material transferases to understand, to go one step beyond MECP2 to see what happens if the material patterns are uh, indeed disturbed. But here, um, erasing um, erasing the material pattern, uh, CPT patterns would actually make the problem more severe because you apparently they are important, you need them, and you need to be able to recognize them with MECP2. Um, so what is also interesting is that there in, in, in little boys, there's another very um, severe um, uh, co condition, and it's basically the opposite of Red syndrome, it's MECP2 overexpression syndrome. Um, uh, uh, so that's um, so. If you have too much of MECP2, it's also a problem. So you need to have apparently exactly the right dosage. Um, and in females, it's actually complex because we have two X chromosomes. And what that means is, um, so we have two copies of MECP2. So okay, I, I should have said. So if 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 you have a deletion um, or a lo loss of function mutation in males. Um, in MECP2, um, this is um, a severe congenital encephal uh, encephalopathy uh, and that causes death within two years. So it's really severe um, because you have only one copy of MECP2. And if, if you have a loss of function mutation in that copy, it's a problem. In females, because you have two copies of, of the X chromosome, you might have one MECP2 that works just fine and the other that doesn't work so well. And then the problem is that um, you, ha you have, um, so one of the X chromosomes in females is usually switched um, completely silenced. We call that X chromosome inactivation. And that means that we have a mosaic pattern um, in females where in, one, in some cells, it's the, um, genes from the paternal X chromosome that are expressed, and in some neighboring genes, patches of uh, cells, um, the the maternal um, uh, chromosome is expressed. And this this is quite random. These kind of whether the paternal or maternal X chromosome is used, and that means that some cells will have the functioning functioning MACP2, and some others will have. Um, are disturbed MECP2, and that will be very, um, that's very difficult. And you cannot, if you have too much of it, it's also a problem. So that's. We have another question in the room, Gabriele. Yes. Say, say it again. So this is quite a complicated question. Uh, the, the one you can come up. Uh, ah, yeah, of course. Uh, well, or, or I can repeat it now, but in, in future you can come up to the mic. Uh, the question is, why is MSP2 particularly relevant in neurodevelopmental disorders? And actually, maybe Gabriele may want to specify whether these are actually neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. And uh, the second one is, uh, the second part is, is DNA methylation particularly important in brain development? I think that DNA methylation, I'm starting with the second one, I guess. Is uh, DNA methylation particularly relevant in uh, brain development? I think it is. Um, and I think that is because it requires a very high amount of plasticity. Um, so in particular, in the time, uh, in the early, early years uh, postnatally, uh, or, or early time postnatally, you have a lot of external signals that you need to integrate and you have to, these 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 cells have to change 
uh, dynamically in response to external, external stimuli. And if that's not working, so I think that is why there's this kind of delay of the onset. So um, if this um, integration of external stimuli is not functioning, is not working functional, the, the, the organism cannot develop normally. Um, I, I, have this, I have the feeling that it is also important, it's potentially also important in other cells, cell types, but um, they are not so much determined on the external signals, if that makes sense. So, but it, it could also be a bias that we are studying these, we have been studying DNA methylation a lot in the concept, context of neurodevelopmental diseases, but also in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and maybe that's a, a bias of, of how we study it. Um, so, um, or study DNA methylation. Um, as I said before, uh, the DNMT3A and B, for example, also popped up in a lot of cancer studies. Um, so in particular, DNMT3A and, and B. So for example, a lot of blood um, cancer types are related with um, problems with the, uh, with the writers of DNA methylation. But my sense is that it's particularly important in the brain because in the brain, you have to um, integrate a lot of external sig signals and remember those over a long timeline. And that's really, and you have to, to, to control that. And that's why this is important. That's maybe not as, um, yeah, it's a difficult question. What was the first question? Sorry? So I wanted to know if these factors are tissue specific, the readers and writers, especially if MECP2 is specific to the brain. Um, no, they are not tissue. Well, I think they have, um, they are very strongly expressed in the brain. They are highly expressed in the brain, in neurons, and not in all, in, not in all uh, brain cells. So we have about more than 70 different cell types in the brain. And um, in particular, in certain types of neurons, MECP2 is very highly expressed, but they are expressed in all cells almost. It's, it's quite universal, but very strikingly highly expressed in neurons. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I think one of the questions was also if it's a neurodevelopmental disease, and that's also quite interesting because um, I, I would answer that question, it is not. Um, so apparently you have a normal development um, in, in the very beginning of your uh, postnatal life, but then the main symptoms start at around one years of age. And you have a, see a developmental regression including loss of speech and hand skills. And uh, you have also um, uh, um, a lot of other breathing difficulties and those kind of things. What is really stunning is one experiment that indeed happened in Edinburgh in, um, in Adrian Bird's lab um, uh, was that the symptoms can actually be reversible in a mouse model. So if you engineer a mouse um, to... Um, to um, express MECP2 um, to, such that you can um, switch MECP2 off and then on again at a certain stage, then you can actually um, cure the disease. So that means that the neurons are not um, degenerated, they are not broken in a sense, uh, they still work, but you need MECP2, you need to be ha to have this readout of the DNA methylation for them to fully function. And I think also if you kind of engineer the mouse such that you can switch off MECP2 later in life, if I remember correctly, this will also lead to red syndrome. So it's not restricted to a certain time in the development. Um, and it can be, and it's not neurodegeneration that is happening. It's just important for the function of the uh, of the neurons. And the reason why I'm bringing this example is really to illustrate how important um, methylation, DNA methylation, and the proper readout um, of this pattern is for how we um, how we um, how neurons are working, but also other cell types. 
And um, the function is still unclear. It has been, so this is, um, uh, so MECP2, how it, how it does what it does is still very much unclear. So there's, there's clearly the idea that it should be recruited. Um, to so we know that it's recruited to C fully methylated, to um, methylated CPGs, like here in the center. Uh, but how it, how it, what the function is, is still to some extent under um, under negotiation. Um, so the first model was really that MECP2 binds to the um, methylated CPG and then causes the genes to be switched off. Uh, but it was also shown that it could lead to activation of genes. So it's not just um, repressive; it could could also be activating. And if we are lo looking at knockout of um, cells which don't have MECP2, and we compare that to normal cells, we found as many genes being repressed um, in response to that knockout as being activated, falsely so. Um, so this is still problematic um, to understand Then there's chromatin condensation. Um, there's also uh, so that the whole chroma, so bigger range effects that the whole chromatin is packaged more densely following the MECP2. Uh, it was linked to alternative splicing and to also protein synthesis and another um, number of other um, um, cases. Um, here's a function that it um, helps to form uh, heterochromatin um, co uh, condensates. That's a uh, newer paper and it's very um, convincing to me um, uh, where, for example, um, the whole organization of the DNA inside the nucleus changes as a consequence of um, uh, having MECP2 or having a, a pathogenic mutation um, uh, in. So it's not individuals' genes, but it's more the bigger organization of the uh, DNA um, in, in the cell nucleus that either allows um, the right program to be read out or not. So, um, the function is still heavily under, um, the precise function again is still under investigation. It's also very difficult to analyze the data. Um, and um, But what I wanted to show here is really the importance both of histone modifications and DNA met, um, methylation, despite the fact that to a large extent, we don't really know how they work yet. And um, that the data sets are quite different, difficult to interpret. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. I think that should be. Uh, yeah, so that's that's basically the last for that. And that would be um, um, the slides that I wanted to share with you today. And I think there's a little bit time for discussion if there are still questions. Thank you very much for a, a, a wonderful introduction to the uh, mysterious world of uh, epigenetics. Uh, a little bit less mysterious now for us, uh, but still, uh, you know, it's it's uh, endlessly fascinating that uh, well, at least I've been interested for many years and, uh, you know, it's still not totally clear what it does, but it does something and uh, and how it does it. It's a, it's a big question. Are there any questions uh, uh, arising Either in the room or in the ah oh yeah we have a question. Uh, I wanted to ask, going back to the machine learning, if there are some mechanistic models that are not good enough to use them on their own, but could be integrated in the loss function to help with the training uh, of the machine learning. Um. I think, yeah, I think, I, I think that's a, that's definitely a way forward. I think in chair, it's it's difficult to answer these questions like very very gene generically because there are so many different problems that each um, sub problems that each require very different strategies um, to tackle them. And so, what I find usually the hardest bit is to actually identify the question that you actually are trying to answer. Um, uh, yeah, um, and I think the most important bit is to um, understand as much of the biology that is un uh, that is confirmed by experiments as you can and use that when you construct your model. 
I don't know, Guido, would you want to answer that, uh, give an answer to that question as well? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, want to uh, you know, abuse my powers as chair, but um, it depends what you want to predict, right? Okay, your, your loss function is generally formulated in terms of what is the prediction problem at hand. For, for some cases, uh, it's, there is no mechanistic model. For some other things, like, for example, uh, that cycle of methylation and demethylation, uh, there was this model uh, proposed by Ferina Wolf in uh, Saarbrücken based on data from um, uh, Jörn Walter, also in Saarbrücken, uh, which was a Markov chain model of uh, mechanistically how the mark was deposited and then removed. Uh, obviously, they contain also a number of parameters to be optimized, but in, in principle, that could also be done in a gradient-based way. Um, the question obviously is whether in, in, in those cases, it tends to be the mechanistic models have been developed either you know, completely separate from data as just conceptual uh, exercises, or they've been calibrated on very precise and small data sets, which often are not so suitable for machine learning. Uh, but it's a very interesting question whether you can then uh, take these and embed them into larger uh, uh, larger topics. I guess, you know, if one wanted to understand uh, how the kinetics of DNA methylation or demethylation are affected by the sequence context, uh, one could do a, a physics-based uh, uh, machine learning model, as you're suggesting. That, that would be my... Like yeah, I think it's it's so it's it's the design and then also the validation is is really tricky that you you have to think about how do you um va validate um your either your model your prediction are you not going back to predicting uh, to validating correlations um it's a very very interesting question. I think it's a at the end of the day, I think you will have to have a combination of of um, mechanistically motivated models and um, uh, and others. Yeah. Any more uh, questions from the room or the uh, or the virtual room? Oh, Alex, come here and speak. Local boy. Uh, thank you, Gabriele, for uh, the talk. Uh, I my question was about uh, data. Like, what could you give us an idea of what is the state of uh, single cell uh, data on, on epigenomics? And have there been instances where, like, uh, people use single cell data and the biological conclusion they draw from the analysis is very different from the ones you get from bulk data? Like, because for the DNA, methylation data you described bulk like really is, is is a very very different from single measurement i guess no so yeah yeah i guess um with epigenomic data um i mean i think the the most used technique would be attack sec where there's a lot of data single cell and uh, and genetic uh, and 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 expression data um done um i think with dna methylation it i mean when you compare it to uh, gene expression, um, so gene expression in a given cell, uh, you have, in most cases for the higher described uh, transcripts, you have um, you have multiple molecules um, per, per, per gene, for example, um, because it's not transcribed just once, it's, it's transcribed a number of times and you measure it. Um, but for DNA methylation, you really have for every C CPG just one molecule, uh, like two molecules forward and reverse strand. Uh, and and that, that means that the data is quite noisy to some extent. Um, and that poses other questions. What I also find interesting is to look at combinations of different. So, for example, the histone modifications. Um, so I've been looking at um, panels of histone modification, like H, like like really many different histone modifications at the same time. Um, and I think that because the co the readers, uh, the writers often contain reader um, domains and they are not acting inter uh, independently, 
um, I think to understand the epigenomic um, pattern, it is quite um, important to record many histone modifications at the same time because um, a, for example, H3K4 trimethylation in the context of acetylation um, and other residues might have a different function than if the acetylation was not there. So it's the combinatorial patterns. And with single cell, um, it is still very difficult to assay um, the nucleosomes, the, the same nucleosome um, across many different histone modifications. So what you really would want to want to know is, is this histone, which of the histone modifications are present in this nucleosome? And that means that you have to do assays, like 10 assays for the same cell. And that's really difficult. You can do two um, and then combine them, um, but you can't do 10. Um, and also the data is, is to some extent noisy and has other challenges. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to combine um, single cell data and bulk data and to try to learn um, uh, to, to, to separate the signals there. Questions. Uh, see hands moving, but sometimes they just too scratch my chains. Uh, but I, the other thing that I want to say, um, so um, I think what where cell um, where single cell really makes a big difference as well is for understanding the um, the the role of the cell cycle. So, for example, I haven't talked about it very much, but for histone modifications. There's no, um, we don't really know how the patterns are propagated across cell divisions. Um, because for every, uh, there's just one nuclear, there's no, I mean, you have the double stranded uh, DNA, so you can easily split that over two daughter cells. You have the CPG context, with, which is symmetrically, so you can kind of copy the methylation patterns to the next cell. But the histones are actually kind of diluted. Um, so some of the histones, so they are removed from the from the DNA, and half of them are going to be inherited by one cell, and the other half is inherited by the other cell. So if you're looking at a local specific way, um, it is not very clear how these how these um, um, marks are precise. So, and if you are re-establishing, re-entering a histone protein into a given locus, then you have to decorate it again with the right patterns. Um, so how that happens is, is not quite clear. So how histone modifications are actually inherited across cell divisions is not very clear. And I think looking at um, single cell data where you can say precisely in what stage um, the cells are in relation to their si cycle, we will learn quite a lot about how histone modifications are being inherited from one cell to the next. We also have another question from the chat. Uh, it's quite an interesting question from Beatriz. Uh, how are MSV2 mutated? Is it from exposure to external factors or are they just hereditary complications? Also, are there instances where there are mutations, but the syndrome was not expressed? Uh, can you repeat the second part? Well, uh, let's do the first part. Yeah. So, is there so I think it's mainly uh, inherited. Uh, no, not inherited. It's spontaneous mutation so in the germline. The, the, the recombination of the fertilized egg. Yeah, it's, it's germline variations. It, it's, it's essentially lethal in, in, in males, so it cannot propagate essentially. It's, it's not something that has a you know, recessive. Uh, but the, the question is, are, are there instances where there are mutations, but the syndrome was not expressed? Are there uh, mutations, but what is not expressed? Well, but, but you don't have the phenotype. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and actually, um, so we don't have a very good, we still, as I, as far as I know, um, so I haven't actively worked on MECP2 for a couple of years now, um, but as far as I know, we don't have a very good structural model of MECP2 yet, um, at least not the whole protein. So there's a lot of um, 
um, we have models, uh, structural models of the DNA binding um, domain and some other bits of the protein. And um, there are mutations. So if you're comparing like um, mutations in the healthy population, um, they do carry um, mutations in the, in the protein, but some of, some of them are not functional. Um, so there are actually quite a few, the, the only two or three domains if you, if you are unlucky and you have a mutation in these domains and in specific amino acids in particular, then you're really unlucky. But there's some, there's always some, most of the time, there's some tolerance in other areas of the proteins. Yes, yeah, so the, there is this bridge model of uh, of atrix, right? Where if you tamper with the DNA methyl binding domain, you go to this, but also there is another position which interacts with another protein complex and that is also gives rise to the phenotype right so there are two specific conditions right? where mutation is uh, gives rise to phenotype but might not have the evidence so it's a rare disease i think the prevalence is what one in twelve thousand uh, girls or something like that yeah Having said that, I um I I I guess um it's a I'm not sure how I mean I think it it takes a lot it, it's it it wasn't easy to diagnose for a long time, um so I have by chance on holidays I have met one girl, um who was only diagnosed when she was I think seven years old um and I I know I also know by chance a boy who has MECP2 actually sadly died now but who has MECP2 overexpression syndrome um but um so I think the prevalence is probably not um well I don't I I mean it depends in the in, in the UK I think they would be genetically tested um and in big parts but this girl was in Austria was from from Austria and she got her diagnosis at I think seven or eight years um so I think the prevalence is not in, in, entirely clear now okay um, and it's also there there are some some mutations which cause a mild phenotype so there's 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 a spectrum of how um, and also the um the random mosaic structure of the cells so if you're lucky and you have a lot of cells which are expressing um the maybe maternal gene which is which is the healthy gene um and not the paternal gene which might be the 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 um the gene that has the mutation um, then your 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 disease would also be uh, milder. So there's there is a spectrum, despite it having just the the origin of the uh, disease is very um, it's just one one gene. Okay, I, I see no further. Uh, oh no, there is one hand. There is one more hand. I was just about to proclaim lunch, but we we wait uh, <laughs> for knowledge. Yeah, so um, MECP2 has both repression and activation functions, right? Um, so um, it is associated both with genes that are repressed, that are being so it is associated. So if you are if you are if you are um, intervening in the system and you're knocking out MECP2 and you are then trying to compare the expression levels of the different genes, you will find genes that go up and you will find genes that go down almost the same number. Um, so it's associated um, with both with, with activation and repression. If that is the, its precise function, I, I'm not sure. I would I would say it's potential. It has more global. It plays a global role in in the packaging of the DNA in the cell. Um, and if that packaging is wrong, then other certain cells are being activated and certain genes are silenced. Yeah. So, like, what factors sort of decide which of those two functions it can perform? Um, so, I, I think. It's an interplay of transcription factor. So um, um, I guess. Um, if the short answer is don't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't, can you see that? Yeah. 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 
So this is somehow the most uh, convincing model at present. So um, maybe, uh, I mean, I have I have shown you um, this at the beginning, right? Um, um, this is this is how the DNA looks like in the nucleus, and you have areas um, which are much more densely packed than others, and um, and you have these um, heterog um, yeah here um, you have these uh, condensates of heterochromatin in there as well. Um, so in the healthy cell, the MECP2 helps to kind of um, package all this because it's 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 binding to CP, methylated CPG. Methylated CPG is found ma mainly in the bulk of the genome. So the um, the promoters are often in um, CPG islands. So the bulk of the genome that is maybe not expressed and that you don't need is kind of uh, collected together in one big um, big uh, heap in the middle here. While <clears throat> if you have MECP2 uh, mutations, it uh, uh, appears that you don't get these foci, you don't get this kind of condensate of the bulk genome. And, um, and I think that will mean all kinds of different things um, to the rest of the genome that you actually need it to be um, easily accessed by transcription factors and so on and regulated. Um, so I think it determines on at, um, other factors, for example, transcription factors, whether the gene is then really activated or not. <coughs> but your whole library is just in a complete model. Thank you. <coughs> Apologies. Oh, one more question. <coughs> so uh, if I understood you correctly, you said that the Red syndrome symptoms can be on a spectrum, depending on how many cells <coughs> in the mosaic are expressing the mutant gene and how many have it inactivated. Uh, but from what I knew, X chromosome inactivation is a random process, in which case roughly 50 cells should have one chromosome inactivated and the other half should not. Uh, or is that wrong or what is the case here? Um, I think it's um, it's probably roughly 50-50, but it's, it's not strictly 50-50. So I think you can be, um, I, I think the proportions vary to some extent. And I think that has an inf uh, uh, effect on the disease. <laughs> Apologies. Also, um, where the mutation is can have more severe um, effects or less severe effects. So it's an interplay of of, of these um, factors. I don't know when when does X inactivation happen in the bad population. You know that because I guess it could be that some subpopulations of cells mostly use one allele as opposed to the other. There's some very interesting work from Angus's lab coming out, or it's it's it came out actually where they looked at <clears throat> at that, and it one thing that they showed is actually that there's um, there's in some individuals there's actually a huge um, um, proportion of inactive um, X chromosome inactivation ex es e e escape, so they actually do express higher levels of X chrom of the X of the second X chromosome. And um, also some genes are affected, can escape uh, X chromosome inactivation. And this in turn has a huge impact of the expression levels of the other uh, genes on the other, on the autosomal um, chromosomes. So I think, again, this is, um, this is not very well understood. Um, I don't think it's 50-50 in every individual. I think there's a, quite a big variability um, in X chromosome inactivation between individuals. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, it's now time for lunch. Thank you so much, Gabriele. Uh, You're welcome. Antonio, do you want to make announcements? Yeah, but we can close the session. Let's uh, close the uh, session. Uh, uh, I guess it's too early for you to have lunch, but we can thank you anyway. Thank you. And uh, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Stop the recording, right? Yeah.